Yeah. Yeah, go. It's a lovely day. Welcome to part 31. Let's go and make some fun. Whoa! Okay, so rolling in. I said we're getting on with the interior trim. So we load up interior trim. All the bits, all the goodies. And we head off out now to get these seats dropped off at the trimmer. So that's going to be part of uh, episode 31. Is a bit of a mission off out on the road. We're going to get that engine as well. So, first of all, let's drop the seats off. Ah, ha, 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 proper music. Nice one. Yes. Okay, both hubs are on the clip now, and the roll bar swapped round the right way. So just going round to find anything else. Roll bar brackets in. There we have it, fitting on the inner side of the wings. I think they're the right way round. It could be that these need flipping. That the lower holder is that, that side. We just swap one from one side to the other if I have to. I have to check on the inner inner wing. But that's the roll bar in place. The brakes, we've got one brake pipe, I need to order another one round there for the brake pipe. Slots into the back of those brackets which you fit here. And the brackets have a little uh, lock-in tabs so that the the nut on the end of the brake hose or the moulded part of the uh, brake hose slots in and locks. Star washer and then uh, the bolt on. Star washer and the bolt. And there's your flexi hose so that it can uh, turn with the wheels. Racks connected up, we'll be to get that set up next. So that's it for this little section. A couple of little things just to put on the clip, then we'll start on the steering rack. We'll get those tubes remade, and we'll get the gaskets and everything fitted back on and uh, put that back together and grease that up, put the boots on it, and we're okay. And um, we'll test that, pressure test that steering rack. So those tie bars squashed in nicely. There's your end of your stabiliser bar. Not sure how much torque to put on, how, many, how much to squash the ends of these little donut bushes here. We'll have to just see what they normally look like, they're pretty tight. Okay, it's Friday evening, I'm calling it a day now, I've got some good progress made today. I've ordered some new locking tabs for the back of the discs, for the rotors, these locking tabs that go between those two bolts because I can't find those other ones. I've ordered some stainless steel ones, a matching set of four, so it won't bug me. I'll put a whole new set of four on, pads are in both sides, nipped up the bolts so that the rotor disc is exactly halfway between the calipers and then just slacken off the touch and that should be sitting in the right place on those taper bearings and I think that's it for today, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the opening part of the show so far, we've plenty in this film, let's keep going. Well 25th of March I would say it's the first official sunny day of the year. Great. Spring's arrived, everybody. We're like it. That means the season's ahead. Gonna be fun. All right, straight back in. Nice, fresh Saturday, sunny day. Love it outside. So we just spotted a few things when I got home that were wrong on the clip. So finished off in part 30 with our super clip. So 31 season's just finishing it off. I'm going to take you through building up some brake lines. We're going to get them brake lines in. I've got two brake hoses at home, a matching pair with the overcoil things on them, so we're going to bring them in on Monday. For now we'll build the brake link-up points. 
just a few corrections to do thanks for um, pointing out on YouTube to uh, some of the viewers spotted the washers the wrong way around you're right they were supplied in the kit the way I fitted them which is flipped round but it seems better that that recessed cup is for the bottom of the rubber of course quite obvious really so thanks for that comment there pointing it out to me so we fixed that the uh, roll bar brackets at the front were uh, the bolt inboard so I've just flipped those this side come off the other side so that bolt's inboard I'm going to have a longer bolt in there simply because the superflex or polyflex or flowflex bush needs quite a long run in on the bolt it's quite quite uh, hard to squash uh, I can probably now they've bedded in a bit I can probably replace these with shorter bolts now just by clamping that taking the bolt out and fitting the correct shorter bolt that's a bit long same on that side they're a bit long it's just about to begin touching that bracket there so I'll clamp them and replace the bolt with the correct one just using that long bolt to draw it in really uh, those cups were right so we're okay so we're gonna flip straight into the brake pipe build up now for the calipers and that run across the back so here we go let's get some brake pipe lined up we've got some handy reference material here in the workshop manual <coughs> giving us the brake sizes which is handy so we've got the diagram showing the layout of the brakes let's go to it take you to it now it's up here and then it gives us the length of each pipe so you can look up the code of the pipe listed here get the length and then you can come in and then um, it gives you the diagram, I'm just going to try and find it. TK019 was the one I'm interested in at the moment. There we are. So TK19, the short piece on from the caliper to the uh, distribution bracket. So that's giving us 220 mil. So we're going to make that one first. Could use this on the back axle and may well redo the back axle lines actually now I've got reference to this it's um, probably be neater and we've got the flare at the pipe bender as well on board I'll show you that in a sec pipe bending material the tool back to that list TK19 just double check there's information on bending the pipe so we've got some info on this here so we'll give that a bit of a read so TK019 we definitely know it was that one and then the uh, just on the next page wasn't it so TK19 sorry 2k19 206 mil so over here to the rule and then 206 mil so just around this area on the rule so I'm going to cut that there now mark and cut okay 206 mil into the pipe bender so we rotate a uh, pipe cutter rotate round and then get that piece of pipe cut then the fittings on either end the male and the female for this and then we'll get on with uh, flaring it and then we'll get on with bending it because we've got to get the fittings on first before we do any bends some tight bends on this one okay shake that one to go over that caliper quite a tight little turn and curve to get it in it's showing it on the diagram coming up then looping dropping back down so that's 206 mil length pipe which does fit and just goes behind the, the uh, brake nipple and fits onto the input of the pipe there so that is it now <clears throat> there's some tight curves and we've got a little tip for you to get them tight bends on there fill it with salt there's our table salt down here little tip sounds odd but on the female end I was able to use that as a funnel taped up this end with some uh, Tessa tape or you could just put blue tack on the end if you want or anything just to block that hole but don't let it go inside of course then fill that with salt tap it do it when it's straight obviously you gotta do it when it's straight and the, the copper will fill up with, with salt that stops it kinking the salt can't compress internally and um, you can get some curves. I bent it around a socket bar, use a combination of the pipe bending tool just down there just to start it off and then um, round a uh, 
socket bar a little bit by hand keeping the salt in then tap it and all the salt will shake out and um, tap tap as much as you can don't blow it just yet because you'll wet the salt and it goes uh, it'll go solid so just tap it I glanced it with the airline as well to make sure later on so we'd, we've blown it out clear then that's done we can offer that up to there pop that on and that fits in as far as I know that's it there's no other real way it could go I mean this could be a tighter curve and it could drop down and loop back up from the bottom to me that would seem the right way as opposed to this way but I don't think the fact that it's coming up is going to be a problem so we're on there with a brake line we do the same for this side I don't know if yeah it looks like that would suit with the bend on the other way so we're going to make one from this but curve in the other side uh, that's probably the hardest brake forming we've got to do um, looking on the diagram for the car it's showing that the feed for the other caliper is coming down the splitter here and across which would seem sensible on the car at home on the Portuguese it shows the pipe coming up then dropping down and going down that way so I've no idea why they decided to do it that way on a factory car that's the Portuguese car the manual showing from the splitter coming down using these clips on the subframe the final clip there then down across and feeding into the uh, the other side of the flexi hose here so we've got a, a right angle another right angle across another right angle then some gentle bends down that way um, that might not be able to put salt in it I don't know we'll have to see and so we can get some nice curves and, and bends on that but I just don't know why the, uh, the production car the car I've got stripped at home the Portuguese has the pipe output in here and then dropping down whereas on that manual in the workshop manual there it's coming straight back it seems better to go this way and that one can go up and feed this side but um, I don't know why they've done that I really don't know why they've done that we're gonna have to investigate but you would think that this one here would feed straight into the back of this rather than coming up and you would think that that's the input in the top um, but it, it has a flexi input which joins to the subframe so they're showing that flexi input coming in to the front so I guess I'm going to have to do it that way I suppose I can see why they've done this way at the bottom because it could come straight out and link into that it's probably easier to make the curve over the top it won't make any difference physically it'd be exactly the same distribution of pressure it's just interesting why they've got two routes one in real life and one that's in the book anyway that aside I'll make the other caliper curve pipe and um, then we can uh, get on and do the main run across there so brake pipe for part 31 right I'm just laying out this final run across here well I'll say final got one number one after this but gently un unfolding the, the cuniper off the roll Put one fitting on this end. Put one fitting on this end. There. So that's ready. So we just curve it out, find these clips there and the suspension up, up and over that last clip. Then we've got to go round the back. So now we've got to form this female end here and then just put the final curves in. This one, you don't need the salt in this one, it was only on these tight curves where the salt helped us to to get the very sharp bends in it okay let's get this female end on now okay so one last one just uh, this end I'll show you in a minute where we go but uh, just for the salt operation taped up that end salt comes in this end so grab the salt this is so we can get just off screen a sec this is so we can get tight bends without distorting the without distort whoops whoa without distorting the pipe you'll see the salt going in lovely tap you feel the pipe heavy up and the, the salt disappears off down down the tube so there we go that's ready for bending now you can bend that now and it won't internally crush because the salt doesn't compress 
Learned that off YouTube, that's what YouTube's handy for. Wow, okay, let's bend that to shape and I'll take you in on the camera. Yeah, so let's show you how to take you in. So with the salt, we were able to get a quite a good tight bend, no collapsing. Cross, then up into the divider, then over we go and down, across we go and round, up, over and round the back of there to the next flexi hose. So that's the bait lines all done with the aid of uh, the pipe bender, some salt and the brake flaring tool. So all that happens now, the, this he has a flexi hose that goes to the bulkhead of the car that allows for a little bit of movement between the clip and the, um, the body of the car without snapping the brake pipe. So flexi for that short piece that goes on the adapter on the inner chassis arm of the car so when the clip moves around you're not going to fracture your brake line so even though the diagram shows that as a solid piece of pipe I'll show you what I mean look they must have altered this because hang on it's volume down and uh, they must have altered it because showing here we have the flexi hose for the calipers which is fine but when it comes to the splitter here it's a solid pipe to the brake master cylinder there's no uh, provision there for the flexi. So I'm not quite sure why they don't show that piece fitted in it. Uh, the left hand, the right hand drive showing the same layout. Okay, so that's that. We're done for that now. Move on to another job. And here's another anomaly I spotted. An error or something different. Look in the book here at the the flexi hose um, bracket that mounts to the caliper it's showing that the bracket there is the pipes coming in higher up you can the left and right handed brackets so that bracket there is mounted on the highest point at the top of the bolt at the top of the caliper unless this photo is upside down which I don't think it is so that bracket there that way round look on this and the brackets at the bottom so they decided in one picture it's fitted this way in another picture that's at the top so I, I checked that on the photograph and I just looked on that diagram and so they can go two ways and obviously depending which way it goes will affect the, the length of this pipe here so uh, I ain't going to flip them the other way around and remake that pipe um, I'm going to confirm a few things. I'm hoping that my loop up here isn't in the way, but you can tuck it and compress it down a little bit more. We could do that, but I don't uh, really think it's it's worth it. So tricky on that last pipe. Uh, just tricky because they're showing this bracket here in different positions in the book. I set it off the photograph, and then I look on the diagram, and it's showing this lower down. I don't know if it's going to affect it. I mean, it'd be better higher up, more ground clearance. The lower that goes down the lower it is to the ground so you would think logically keep that up and high out of the way so um, whether it's wrong when they've sketched it out I don't know but that would be going higher up diagram shows these really tightly curved but I'm not going to do them that tight I could take them off and put salt back in them and then rebend them but um, I don't think it's a problem than looping up it's the kind of detail which I'm not going to worry about too much if someone says that's not factory shape. That's going too far in my opinion, it, as long as it functions. You know, um, you can just take them in a bit there. Okay, so safe, not dangerous, functional, clean and neat. Someone comes up saying that's not a factory curve there. Well, no, I don't care. That's my cut-off point. That's where I stop because you waste so much time just trying to get that right I mean you know I did it the best that I could on a second attempt that was a second attempt and that reaches my uh, abilities um, I'm happy with it that's that's my level my personal level there okay so I think I can get better making brake pipes there's certainly a skill to it to get yourself uh, making some really great pieces but it's, it's looking neat along there all right so that's my level. Right, so now that the brake lines are done, I've two more flexi hoses by the way to bring in. These are just mock-up ones. That one's not a brake flexi a caliper hose at the back, that's for that's for the back axle. Uh, I've got two of those. So um yeah, you've got a flexi hose to fit there. We haven't got 
Well, I've only got a second hand one. I'll show you what they look like in case you're using, you may be using the video for reference material, so I'm trying to always include reference material. That's the short hose to the bulkhead. I'll say the bulkhead, it goes to the inner wing bracket, but it's a short little hose. If I hold it back in my hand, you can see, and that's that. Another spare splitter unit. So, coming into the middle of the splitter unit, so we know that was right. That's how it would have gone, that's how it came off Ruby. Just like that one there. So you can go either way. I've gone round the top and down. And this one comes underneath and back. Okay, so brake lines for the front. Brake lines for the back. Done. We've just got the solid single pipe now, which connects. And the servo pipes to do. We do those when we're building the engine bay itself. Do them live in the engine bay. Although I could use one of my working um, cars the chopped off front end of a car to build myself a set of lines ready to go if I wanted and I've got some front ends chopped up back at uh, home then I could climb into an engine bay and build build up the uh, brake lines if I wanted we'll see for now we, uh, we move on to another task it's a quick tidy up of the tools and put everything back a little tea break and then we'll see where we're going, see what, what's next, but that's some good progress made on the tubes. Okay, we'll see you in a minute. A little update for you, just if you're using it for reference. Locking tabs, we forgot about those. And uh, the correct size of the head bolt, 17, not 13. So 13 for the locking tab, you know, uh, 17 for the locking tabs to work, not 13 heads on these power assisted steering rack uh, tabs. They were done and they're ready because I had a feeling there was something missing off this because it, it shouldn't be able to vibrate itself loose so you've got to have uh, locking tabs on the steering rack obviously anything associated with steering is bolt and, bolt and braces so um, locking tabs for your 17 head bolts and I didn't have the um, bolts in stock for the powered steering rack they were designed for saddle clamps which were a lot thinner the power steering rack has this raised section so I had to dig out a couple of longer bolts which may not be the right exact right length it doesn't really matter they just come underneath here a little bit longer than they would that's all so no problem with that so locking tabs for the power steering racks it's a good thing to have uh, I know I've said this on the last film but because it's at working height on this uh, little trolley you're able to keep coming in and out take a fresh view have a, have a break get a drink or come back in the next day and you can get a fresh look at the clip just in case you've missed anything because there is quite a lot going on with it you know to get it all right and um, just using your memory to recall how it all went together it's quickly forgotten mine's been a couple of years since I rebuilt one Whilst I can refer back to the videos, I wasn't as comprehensive on the early series of films with Swampy and I was still learning the techniques of, of filming as we still are now but um, my filming has improved you learn as you go along all about technique and things and I try and put myself in your shoes if you were building a clip I try and cover stuff which is why I've given it plenty of pan angles round so you can pause the video uh, if you're unsure, pictures a videos thousand words. Pictures a thousand words, a videos ten thousand words, or ten lots of pictures. Oh, what's the maths on that? Uh, no. Anyway, video covers more. So going round for you, this little section of the film now is a designed for you to pause the the shot so that you can uh, use it. Now, don't take my break prep pipes as your reference you can build them how you want but that's the route that I've gone you might want to do a better job on these if you want uh, you might uh, just copy the way that I've done it using the salt inside there and freehand a lot of it was freehand so going round so you can see this pipe ignore it this is a longer this should be a longer pipe and it can have the coily spring round it the protecting spring all right so I'm trying to cover every word for you. This is a pre-facelift clip, so between 70 and 73 before they slightly changed it. There's not a lot of changes, but there are some subtle ones. 
Okay, going to have a front for the anti roll bar brackets there, inboard now. Those anti roll bar bolts you see are too long, see how it's just starting to touch the inside there? It's actually tight before it hits it, but it's very close. We'll swap them out in a minute, they'll be shorter ones. It's just I needed longer ones to compress the very hard flow flex roll bar rubbers. I could, if I used the short bolt you couldn't squeeze the bracket. I like to use the bolt to try and get the bracket to pull. But now they've sort of squashed in a bit. You can lock pliers on here and then replace the bolt. We might even go now. It's, uh, it's, it's crushed them in. Okay. And obviously I've got power assisted steering. As opposed to the smaller rack that you'd have here. So there'll be differences there. You can see how it fits. I told you about the scallop out here. And a little bit there to get that tube to lie flat, but it's not bad. Only a minor mod for that. It's pretty good. Just bring you around as slowly as I can. Give it a push there. Then my hand here, I'm just giving it a pull around. See? And round we go for this side, just if there's anything else. Let's pull towards us. We'll pan back now for you. So this section of the video to help you pause and freeze frame, which is why I'm panning really slow and I'll go overhead now as well, going to take you up as high as I can reach, trying to help. So right up to the top, letting go of the camera now, pushing my arm outwards using the LCD screen as my viewfinder. Okay, you with us there. To help you with your clip at home. All right, I'll sit for now then for that bit. My lens cap just dangling in for a shot there. There we go. Hope that helps. Your brake calipers. That's coming on those at the back. I need to fit the little springy uh, pad shim retaining springs, I don't know how to fit them, I'm going to have to look in the book, I can't quite work it out. Okay, we are, we've got to mark out the, we're at the body shop, we've got to mark out the trim holes now, we've got all the measurements ready, I'll show you how we got those measurements soon, but we're rolling up and we're going to drill the trim holes for the GXL mouldings, here we go. Just marking out the holes now. That's it, all that markings off. Took off the original panels then. That's it, cheers, Got it. There's a lot of people, they'll want to know these markings, so if people are doing it at home, they can. Yeah. I got all these off original four panels I had lying around the workshop, so there we go. Just 
cost her the most and she lives on the coast uh -huh. he said she's faster than most and she lives on the coast uh -huh. here we go we're gonna do some more work let's go on with it oh you enjoyed some of the footage that's been going on recently ladies and gentlemen we found a gxl in the woods oh yeah wasn't that good but i'm halfway through episode 31 so uh, we're between jobs. We've got some more galvanising parts to pick up, ladies, pick up, ladies and gentlemen. And we got to see uh, Warren in his shed with his engine. So let's keep going. It's going to be good. We'll jump to the next job. Let's get right on it. Okay, got to keep talking because the YouTube will pick up the music and block the channel so we've got to be really careful alright so let me just turn down the volume a touch we like to have our rock music on in the workshop everybody essential reading there let's just do that hopefully it wouldn't have got that you know what I mean about it essential work in my little my nice little workbench there real good now let's get over here we slowly pan you across, so I step across obstacles. Brakes done, shocks on, gas shocks on. The bolt kits for each component connection, we've got them ready, made up these little bolt kits. Obviously they were galvanised and so I've just sorted out which ones for where. I think I've got it right, I've been trying to just remember which bolts for where, but you want to make it so that when the axle's offered up, you're all ready and on standby. Just waiting for some anti-roll bar bushes got uh, the brackets going in on those arms there those lower trailing arms the brackets two of them are just pushed in in a snug fit we've got to choose some bolts for those so we did that we also managed to get ourselves a nice brake bending tool from the NEC a tip off from from Mark there with Fury the Mark 3 Cortina that he restored so we managed to get a great shape on our caliper um, brake tubes here just with that tight uh, fitting is on your caliper there you can use a nice little brake bending tool which will show you it's a compact little um, mini set of claws that you just use to get a good right angle without crushing the tube so that worked well we've got the brake retaining springs on the back there they stop the pads from rattling against you you um, your brake disc rotor by just creating a force that flips the pads outwards and keeps them away from the face of the um, rotor when you're not braking and it stops a rattling sound I need some on Swampy because uh, I didn't fit them on Swampy and I always notice a little brake rattle so I'll be fitting those onto the Swamp Monster at some point but they're nicely greased up the pins and the Clevis pins and everything are on our bleed nipples are fitted there ready to go here's our flexi hoses nice new ones there um, got the rack bolted down we've got our securing tabs on the rack ready to go we're just waiting for some galvanized nuts and bolts and uh, some new seals for our lovely power steering setup these uh, power steering pipes were hand formed okay what else have we got I think that's it for the clip we're all together oh our shocks are on I knew there was something else the spacks fit just inside there we had to just um, squeeze the wishbones up with a ratchet strap I used the spring compressor tool first to close the spring then held it in place with a ratchet strap here because the shock absorber wasn't quite long enough to fit in when there's no shock absorber at all it just allows a bit too much opening of the upper and lower wishbones and you can't get the shock absorber bolts to reach so you if your car was under load on the roadside you just put a jack under your um, your hub here and jack it up and that would cause the spring to compress because the weight of the car would be would be pushing down the engine and the weight of the car would be holding the clip and so you can collapse it it's just that if your clips off the car and um, your shock absorber goes on last you may need to uh, spring compress lock with uh, a wire tie a wire tie a ratchet strap make sure you get it in a place that you're confident with it I went just inside the wishbones there and over the top with a block of wood to protect the powder coat 
and the strap went round. I don't think we've got that on film. So strap it up and um, use a spring compressor. Your ratchet strap won't be able to compress the spring, so you've got to compress the spring with the tool. I think we showed you the tool earlier on. If not, I'll give you a refresh. Look back on the previous video and you'll see that us making this tool. It's a bit of box section, some high tensile threaded bar, a locking tab at the bottom, a tube at the top. We use that to squash the spring. It effectively replaces the shock absorber. Be careful when you're using it. If you're making one, go double, double, double on your welds and make sure your welds are good. If it gives way, you could end up with a lot of uh, kinetic energy being released and um, hurting your feet, your eyes, your hands, if anything kicks out. So, SPAX adjustable shock absorbers on. Everything else on the front that I can think of other than the power steering rack's ready. We need to start looking at the power steering rack situation in terms of building it up and operating it. You'll see the pump just down coming into the middle of your screen now, ladies and gentlemen. There's your power steering pump. We need to be running that up on a little mini jig and get it spinning with a motor. And then we'll check that there's no leaks. I don't want to be um, having leaks in here when the engine's in. It's going to be too cramped to work on. It can be done, but it's easier if we test the system on the bench. So we'll be bench testing the power steering as part of the engine and gearbox build series of the video okay so keeping on going for this episode as always let's switch to another task and here we go keeping you on in the same tracking shot we've got a box here which is that weren't missing here they are calipers but me yeah uh, i was missing some locking catches and i found those so they're going in the parts tumbler right now and we're going to go to uh, brinksway and pick up some of the galvanizing stuff and drop these off and maybe catch warren okay off we go parts tumbler first for these door catches a lot of these parts are my long lost parts um, so I thought I'll just put the whole lot in just may as well have them in stock I think I've probably got overkill on door catches there but I'll just make sure that there's no plastic parts on the door catches which could get lost or damaged in the tumbler because they do have little locking tabs and things there okay there's there's a locking tab plastic insert there you want to take them out and put them in a, in a nice sealed bag for later. We've got some uh, door boot catches there, they can go in, that's ready to just go straight in. Uh, this one here coming up now, that needs its rubber boot removing and that'll be cleaned and, and bagged up ready to, to place on the uh, the new lock. They don't always have those rubber boots, uh, they're often missing so good that we've got a nice rubber boot there and, and another one too. So these parts are just the missing parts, I found them in an old fridge in my yard, I must have put them in there for some reason so some screws in with that one, so these as I say will go in, some door striker catches, I think we're doing okay for striker catches but it's good to have them in spare spare stock, so we're going to get carefully those screws out at the top with the exact correct fitting screw and you'll find it a lot easier to do when you get that so there's enough for two batches of parts tumbling stuff here you can see what they look like now and then we'll show them you when they come out of the tumbler just so you can get an idea whether you want to buy one or not so these you could start wire brushing these up now if you want but if you've got a tumbler it's just a lot easier to chuck them in pre galvanizing if I took these to the galvanizers now they probably would clean a lot of that off just by the chemicals and the process that they use but you get a leading edge um, if you already present parts as clean as you can you're just going to get a, that better quality result uh, in terms of trying your galvanizing at home with the home kits I personally think for a mass uh, production run you'd struggle it's alright for the odd part um, that perhaps the galvanizers couldn't put in the tank or that was fragile but the home kits you really need to be set up and really give it some dedication can be done but I found galvanizing costs for me I thought were pretty reasonable um, one for Jim over here coming up I know he likes these items underneath there it's one for Jim now these are great these spiders because they eat flies I like them I save them I love them 
I don't ever kill, I don't actually kill flies as it happens, I just wash them out of the way, but um, unless, unless one really annoys me. But uh, no, spider, in with the bits. Watch it, Jim, it's on you, it's after you. Wow, well, here's a bit for train spotters. Train spotter section coming up. I never knew this. Two types of uh, boot release catch, look. Two hole sizes. Could it be one of them's not Cortina? I have to investigate the situation. I think the locking pin goes through there. Why a smaller hole? Check it out, park codes. Train spotter section, alert, alert. Right, and two ways of fixing the rubber boots on. Hold on while I turn the radio down. Let's just stick with it. Two ways of holding on the, the boot gator. Some clips there, look, over edge clips, see them in green. And on here, looks like it's just over some little tabs. Interesting, learnt something again. I know it's a bit boring to talk about boot catches, but no, I don't know, you know, I like little bits like that. Two different boot catches for some reason, we'll find out why. And two different ways of securing the rubber boot over there. Sorry for that sad little bit of info. Get in touch. Uh, with me by email, Ian Okay, two hours in the tumbler and that's, that's not bad, but we're going to clean these up now and finish off. I just want to get the worst off, now I'm going to get my shot blaster to just do the face this bit, you don't need to do the back, and that just gives it an extra touch, just as any, any crows in the tumbler can't get off, but it does get off virtually everything, good enough to depend on how high you want to go with your, your level of work. For me, I just want to see there's some pitting in that one. It's, it's not touching it. Others, it's really good. So it just depends, but I'm going to get them to just dust the fronts of each one, the high vis section of each part. There's no need for him to go into the back, and then I'll air blast these out. Here we go. Off to the shot blasters with these ones to finish them. You don't need to do it. I'm just, I just, just going that extra little bit for me. Okay. All oh, right, just to just put some uh, wheel nuts on the end of those. There were the wheel nuts that I'm actually going to use. They're forward out of the bag. I'm going to talk you through. Over we go to the axle. I'm going to talk you through the brake system, just for reference for anyone building up their axles who um, can't quite work out how the brakes. Now this is going to be brakes for the larger nine-inch setup. So only applies to the, the larger <clears throat> brakes on the 2 litre cars, okay, for an estate on a 600 any, or a heavy duty axle. We'll take this cover off, this drum, and we'll have a look how those brakes are set up and I'll talk you through what I've learnt. Here we go for that cover off. For, did I say cover when I meant brake drum? Right, brake drum off. Okay, place that down. 
let's get that just there. Now then, other than me half shaft, which isn't finished yet, <clears throat> let's have a look at the brakes. So, your cylinder there, and then these locking pins, bear in mind if you've just acquired all the bits to build it up and you weren't off your car, in other words you've been scrabbling in boxes trying to assemble it, <clears throat> there are two lengths of these pins, 600s have shorter pins and you'll find that if you try fitting them like I did, you'll be struggling to get the springs on and these collars because the pins are too short so you need the longer version pin for the two litre setup so make sure you've got that <clears throat> right these little washers twist and lock and then that, that uh, washer comes off and you're able to take the, the uh, shoe out I'm just going to talk you through how it's actually assembled and an easy way to do it so that you're not struggling with these springs but we're going to talk you through it I'm not going to do it on this side actually I'm going to do it on the other side of the car because I've yet to fit a fork an adjuster fork which I didn't have in stock there was one missing somehow I'm going to go over to the other side of the axle take the whole of this apart and we're going to build it together okay let's do that now so brake 2 litre 9 inch brake assembly okay here we are with uh, a partially assembled brake uh, drum set up on the back axle you have got one of the shoes on you've got leading edges and trailing edges and make sure you get them the right way round one ends thinner than the other the idea being that uh, your forward force um, your forward uh, is this way so the leading edge goes uh, the principal way that it turns okay that's forwards so leading edge on that side I think that's right obviously when you go in reverse it's no longer a leading edge but I think principally most of your traveling is forward so it tends to just enjoy that side being the leading edge I think that's correct if it ain't I'll have to swap the shoes round correct me if I'm wrong on that one guys so what I do to assemble these first you've got to squash the spring in put push the little um, pin through this is the pin that goes through from the back put the spring on then put the collar on then I use some long nose pliers which are really handy grip this in the long nose pliers push and turn and let it go out make sure you've got the right length of pin because there's two lengths of pins for 600 brakes and two litre brakes and then you'll see at the back of this shoe obviously I've assembled this on assuming this is the trailing edge otherwise I'd have to take this off but this on the back of there this adjusting lever the hand just the handbrake lever that I'm moving now and that's held on with a horseshoe clamp you can reuse them you're supposed to put new ones on there's a pin through there and that squeezes together and then you've got yourself your, your um, adjustments I've hung the first spring on the shoe there ready we're going to show you why in a minute okay so I'm just I've just hung one of those springs so this is the type of spring that goes in the back in case you've lost all your springs and you don't know what was going where it's a long spring with a hook at the end hanging on the side what we do now is we're going to get this ready we're also going to get the fork the adjuster fork ready let's take the adjuster fork first I reach back and grab it off screen and bring it into view that is the automatic handbrake adjusting fork uh, funny shape at that end fork at that end and funny shape at that end goes up with the longer piece on top and engages into the area where the handbrake lever is and that slots up inside there what happens with this adjuster is when it's gone up now when I pull on the handbrake Let's take it out so you can see what I mean and we'll bring the light in now. We'll have a detailed look. You can just see middle of your screen now. There is attached to the pivoting point of the handbrake lever a little arm and on the end of the arm it's got a, a pin. Not a pin but it, it pushes on the ratchet of this wheel. Here's the wheel of that, that pin. This pin touching it now 
turns this ratchet adjuster which operates the threaded fork and makes this go longer so each time I press the handbrake pull the handbrake this has an the action of moving like this and each time it does that it gives a little turn on this if there's slack if it's tight it, you'll find that it doesn't do anything to this wheel as soon as the um, pads shoes wear down it's allowing this to open a little bit which just lets this take up the slack and then turns it so it basically keeps this fork expanded pushing the shoes out towards the drum so that when you pull the handbrake on it's instantly grabbing the drum and there's no slack play otherwise if there was play the, 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 the uh, shoes and they pivot at this end the shoes would be pivoting that much before they hit the drum so this fork just keeps them shoes pushed outwards by means of each time handbrake is applied the ratchet has that effect of, of pulling up and across which then pushes onto this ratchet there's two ways the ratchet wheel can fit because the two teeth of it are shaped so that um, this can clip back and create the ratchet so you've got to be careful to put the wheel on the fork the right way round it took me a while to actually work out how it does it but if it's going this way that wheel that arm lever's coming back it needs to be able to clip backwards and then on its upward stroke it pushes it so it doesn't operate it going backwards it operates it when it comes back up so by doing that the wheel can go one of two ways to suit it you want to put it the right way it's got two options you want to put it the way where the ratchet would suit operating it on the upward stroke I think that's right anyway I'm gonna double check all this but at least you're gonna be sort of getting some ideas off me here for this see there's the uh, the engagement of it there we'll, we'll, we'll show you in action soon that's how it works I mean I might be able to actually show it you're pushing down it's just having a go at turning it there see how it's engaging there so we want it so that that lever pushes back and is able to clip back on the teeth at the moment I think that is on the wrong way round no it's not I think that's right oh, we'll double check it but it's got to be able to to clip click and push and click and push and you'll hear it actually making a clipping sound so w before I put the shoe on here I'll show you how we fit the shoe with these springs an easy way of doing it so you don't struggle I'll just check that that lever is working as it should and that the ratchet wheel is the right right way round on its threads okay so I'm just assembling the brake shoes for the the larger drum I'm gonna check that ratchet set situation now and then I'll carry on filming when we know we've got okay I've got the ratchet the right <clears throat> the right way round I'm able to push put pressure on here and the lever itself and actually turn this and it makes the clicking sound just like that clicking sound you can hear as it rotates round it's difficult to do it with one hand because I'm holding the camera but I'm trying to turn I might get this on my thumb now and you might hear the click just there so can you hear that I'm turning that and that then pushes them threads outwards so that's effectively tightening it up and that's what the lever does if the lever's not working you often find people will manually turn this in the car uh, say in the car you know with a drum off because the lever system will have seized and stopped working so that's when you used to take up the slack with this manually because they had had a high failure rate these so you can see how that's now extended the thread and would have tightened up the shoes so that ratchets the right way and it sits in there so what we're going to do we're going to fit this assembly back together I'm going to hang the shoe on the end of this spring I don't need any force to do that I just maneuver it onto that spring you'll see I've also greased the contact points we're going to hang the shoe on there we've already fitted the top shoe of course by pushing that pin and turning that collar on the end of that pin we use long nose pliers to do it I'm going to just show you how the long nose pliers work before we move on with our magic all right so there's that fork adjuster we need to take that back up really now and bring that fork back close so we can assemble it compacted and then adjust to suit so closing that up with my finger 
this is a, a two litre fork they are different sizes on 1600s so bear that in mind these were galvanized by me uh, by the galvanizers so it's nice and shape I greased the end of it as well and greased up the handbrake pivot points let me get the long nose pliers and I'm going to show you what I mean about uh, grabbing these collars so it's easy to fit the collars hold on while I get that right I'm back on with the long nose these are a great tool to use and have around the workshop oh get yourself a pair I've got these off Tang but you can get draper ones you can get if you if you're loaded get snap on but get a good quality pair a good machined end pair Don't go to the cheap because you can have them for life if you get a good quality set so what I used them for adjusting on the uh, pressure adjuster thread there I can lock the collar like this grab it nicely in the pliers put my finger at the back and I can just use this push and turn and we can get this top assembly on with, with the handbrake adjuster already fitted on the horseshoe so add that as an assembly then hang your spring on it there and now we'll move on to the next stage so we don't need long those pliers just yet but I'm just showing you that they're a great tool to use for that and we're going to use them for the spring in a minute as well let's now get the shoe and we're going to hook it on to this and then we're going to lever it into place and we're going to get that pin in there all right so let's do that let me grab the right so i'm standing by with a pin through there my spring and inside the pliers locked on is our locking washer so we're going to get the uh, shoe which i've now hung on the end of that spring and then you you can use the shoe now to pull down and lock into the uh, pivot point there so we pull down on the shoe and then offer it across here and let it slot onto that pin it'll hold itself on that pin till you're ready with this spring then we push on with the pliers like this and turn and lock and we can worry about that final spring later don't worry about that just yet we've got to also offer up the fork at the same time this is starting to come across so i need to get the fork in position up the top and then we're going to pull down on this one i'm just going to put this on the tripod so we can watch that in action let's get the tripod and let's get going you should be on view okay you should be on view my hands are manicured and ready to go locked on spring there you want to see my ugly mug i'm keeping out of the way okay fork don't forget to, to use four candles to light yourself up I'm not going to be able to hold this actual uh, brake adjuster for in position just yet. We're going to have to really be jiggery and bokery around here. I don't think I can lock that in out of the way. It's just too much weight on it. What we need to do is uh, rotate the axis so that that's not going you would work on it the other way around I would have thought but I'm going to pull down now look how I'm just getting that to hook into the bottom of there and then you twist and away you go now what we'll do in this instance I won't put this pin through so I'll take that pin out just so that when I curl this brake shoe round now it's going to catch that fork I would say probably with the axle at 12 o'clock the brake cylinder at 12 o'clock you might not have this situation but for the purposes of what I'm doing lock round then find that fork into there clipping in and away and now we can push the pin through so re-grabbing the pin and looking for the hole at the back to come through the shoe and there we come through the shoe we're now ready to put the spring on and because I've already clipped in the the washer into the uh, long nose pliers we can hopefully engage the situation now the tab on my washer is set at nine o'clock so i want to turn the pin to approximately nine o'clock or three o'clock and then push on find it turn it release it and then you you're good to go there so we have now got well locked on there that was quite a simple easy way see how it saved you a lot of messing trying to like get the spring on now and pulling about you just hook that spring first then hook it at the bottom then lever it up making sure your forks in position there we should be getting a good 
click yet, we're getting the click, so that's working on the ratchet. Now we want to fit that last spring. So coming into your view now is the, the final spring. It's that shape. That hooks in at the top there. And this it, again is where you can use the long nose pliers to your advantage. We reduce down now the, the click, click setting on them so that they grab it. Let's do it off the shoe. There it goes. Off the shoe. I have to bend down there to get that. So I want to make that so that clips in. So I'm just feeling it. There we are. That's about right. So great tool. Look. See? I mean, I need to run through the tools again with you because I've, I've got even more good stuff to talk about with tools. And um, you need a good set of everything. That you, you know, a good set of good quality tools that just makes life easy. Now, with that angle, I can't actually get the spring in we need to come in at a different angle but it does work we need to come in just slightly off you're not going to see this now i have used these on this before i know that it works so just hold on i want to grab it on the very last part of the spring and i'll show you why i can uh, lever it up so in again and now levering it up I'm coming down this is where you've got to take the tension on it and then I just want to get it in. I can see now it's just because the light's on me. So I'm in there, and then I press the release, and then it's in. So that makes life nice. So springs in at the top, over there, over there, where it should all be uh, right now. So now I could, if I wanted to, take the slack up on the fork. You'll find that the fork opens out and it won't rattle anymore. It's starting to push on it now, it gets tighter. So that's forked under tension, and I think that's it. I think that's how it works. I need to just pull, push in the bottom shoe, it's not quite sat there, it'll push in a little bit more. But the idea is what you can see. I think that is the layout now. What I'm going to do is double check it all and make sure I've got it. Right, but I think that's the layout. The spring, I can't quite see it without crossing into your camera lens, but the spring rests on the ratchet as well. It does on the other side, almost to sort of give it some more tension. So that is, a, is how it's set up, uh, your brakes. Because, I mean, I, I struggled. I did Swampy's brakes, and uh, I forgot all, how to do them. In fact, I'm not even sure that Swampy brake adjusters working so this has given me good reason to go back to Swampy and check everything out including the front anti-rattle uh, pins so um, yeah my hands about the same size as a one way of finding out if uh, Cortina's got a larger brake on just use your hand Let's move on to the next thing. We can put the cover on this now. I'll show you this working. I'll take you off the tripod and we'll go in and dangerous and have a little look. Let's go close up, see how it's done, and we'll move to another job. So brakes on that one. Moving along. We're definitely all in and okay there. Right into me and let me know if you think I've done this wrong. So springs going across that. Ratchet lever pulls it up when we operate the handbrake and then opens the fork out and squeezes out the I think that's how it should be. The diagrams in the book don't really make it that clear, which is why I've done this film. So you could be doing your brakes the same time as me, or, or you found this video years ahead, and you're using it for reference. I hope that it can help for your brake reference. Okay, enough on the brakes now. Let's move on to our next task for this part 31. I hope we're on, are we on 31 or 32. I don't know, I've lost track now. I'm trying to keep this under an hour again and we might be now approaching an hour and you might think well there's no high octane stuff in the film where's all the, the high octane craziness going but we want to get this detailed um, and on film all this building up of the clip and the axle so I've took a little bit of time and that's filled out the video so why don't we put some high octane stuff later on in part 32 or 33 um, well probably will be because we'll be looking at the shell getting painted you saw just a few clips um, a few minutes ago of the me marking out with the laser line 
and drilling the holes for the body so that's showing you that we're, we're nearly ready to put the primer on the body so we'll be covering that on the next film I'm going to wrap this film quite soon and it's um, because I don't want it to go over an hour okay so clip over there axle over there and I'm just going to tidy up and line everything up and we might just give it a little closure today so I'll try and get some exciting footage down but it's quite uh, useful for you to have this video reference of the brakes. Now, I know I'd find this interesting if I was watching the video, so the chances are someone else out there may think the same way as I do. And that is, let's operate the handbrake and watch the ratchet go. Now, it works on its return journey, so when you pull the handbrake, it actually won't adjust it until you let go of the handbrake, and that's when it pushes on the pins. That's what it seems to be to me. So keeping the light somehow, this is going to be tricky, keeping the light somehow there, wow, I'll just whack the tripod. We need to go up with a screwdriver and pull down on the, the handbrake lever, which you can only just see on your screen, trying to engage with the screwdriver and the light. Quite tricky. I could come in from the top and maybe I need to pull down on the handbrake lever because my cable is not on. I haven't got a handbrake cable connected. That's it, I'm pulling. Now you can hear it clicking. As I've pulled down now on the release of it, it should turn the ratchet. So letting go, obviously uh, I've let go and it's jammed in position, but it would normally come up now. That wheel should turn. There it is. Can you see that? There it goes on the upward, on the upward click. So it's now pushed the forks out a little bit because it's finding that there's gap here between the uh, drum because they've worn down. What would happen if there was no gap is... The ratchet would just slip on there because it wouldn't be able to force the fork out anymore and then there would be no turn so that would just cl click on it I presume that's what it does it's only that that makes me question whether I've got these ratchets on the right way round that's the only thing I'm not sure about them little fun wheels there I can't find any documentation now I would say that I've got how it would work it when the ra uh, ratchet arm does the operation on its return journey but I may be wrong on that we need to double check but the assembly of it all I think is correct if indeed it's not all correct I could do with someone who knows whether I've got that the right way so my question out there would be does the handbrake lever push the forks out on its outward journey or its return journey in other words when I pull the handbrake on does that start to turn that wheel or does it slip past that first and then turn the wheel on its return journey? Let me know. Okay, moving on to something else. I thought I'd show you that working. All we've got to do is do these half shafts. We just uh, clean them up, the half shafts, and paint them. And then we're done. I'm not galvanizing the half shafts. I cannot see the point of taking them off and taking them to the galvanizers. Okay, over and out for now. Guys, I wanted to cover the uh, plungers at the back. I've just clipped that one in. I use a little socket to tap it in, it just clips into place. I think that you use that to check the adjustment of the handbrake clearance. I think that you push that lever down then you measure the amount of movement in it to see if the, uh, the brake shoes are worn out. I think that's what it's for. It's an aware indicator. I don't think it's a way of adjusting the brakes or taking up that ratchet. It doesn't seem to operate the ratchet by the way it's designed. So. I think that's a, a measurement device. I can't find any documentation on it just yet. It just calls it an adjustment plunger in the book. But we think that might be to measure the amount of movement. In fact, I seem to recall reading that in the Ford book about measuring the tolerance on that. So it's a little plastic plunger that moves up and down and it touches on part of the brake mechanism inside on that lever there. Pushing it down, as I say, doesn't seem to do anything. So it could be a wear indicator. In device so other than that we're all done okay here we are on another task which is the distribution box the lower part of the heater assembly that fits under your bulkhead it goes this way round we've cleaned the plastics up on this and we've got the new flaps powder coated the internal flaps powder coated we've got to re-rivet it back together but before we do that we want to fit some nice padding to the flap so that when you operate them they don't make a clanky sound they make a, a soft muted sound so that's where they are at the moment that's where 
clunky clunky uh, so we're just going to line these with some uh, closed cell foam sticky back stuff we'll warm these flaps up so it sticks nicely then we'll put that on and that'll make a nice uh, sound we only need to do the inside face of this curved flap because if you put too much foam on the back of this it's not going to be able to open fully it's going to land about there so and it also doesn't make a noise clangy on the opening of it if you listen it doesn't actually do that and it wouldn't have any advantage having foam on this side is no action it's to close and seal and then open that way so we only need it on the inside face of that one both sides on the other flap to stop that noise we want it to just make that nice closed door sound all right so they've been powder coated there's two types of these if you've got a facelift car you'll have them with the levers on the other side because the the dash on the facelift is totally different you end up with the levers so these are facelift levers i had them done by accident because i've just got a mixture of parts so now i've got them ready i'll now go and get the close cell and the blade i've got the blade ready here and we're just going to cut some strips place them on there then we'll get them rivets back in and we'll pop that back together and it's ready and there it is okay i've got the, the padding ready there just gonna take that first flap out and measure up it should be all right with this piece just going over it so get a rule out now and we can cut some straight lines and pop that over there and stick that on both sides slightly smaller piece. well no i'll do them both the same side i think the ceiling edge is this edge so as long as we come up to there we can leave a gap here for it to pivot on don't want to have it compressing itself so cut two pieces up some scissors will probably do it and then i'll attach that to that and we'll reassemble do the same on the other flap as well so in a second you're going to see me putting this back together and we'll get the little rivets i'm just going to um get a a, a completed assembly down and just check that all the rivets are in the right places because i've forgotten where they go i'm going to get one that's already that's not been touched by me okay leave me with it i'm going to do some cutting okay our foam pads are on and they're, and they're making the flaps sound nice it's just uh this foam i got off ebay there self-adhesive to say i think you call it closed cell foam it probably is it was actually i actually bought it our sound uh, deadening material on ebay actually it's down as sound padding but it works well for this application so we can now put the other half of the shell together on this a little bit of grease first on these pivot points let's make them even smooth than they are so we'll get some grease on those now then we'll we'll put the two halves together and get the rivets in place and then we can put this wrap this and get it out of the way it's another thing off the bench it's another job off the list and it'll start to close the end of this uh, video until next time but we'll get that riveted up we'll finish off with uh, a collection of parts in the workshop for us to look at before we close the film and we can see where we're up to and make our plans for starting to rebuild the car i've got um, also an air filter box complete i'll bring that down and show you how how that came out as well and a, a couple of other few little pointers i'll make before i close the show okay okay we're back two halves are back together nice foam action on these now uh, well, once it's riveted i'll i'll take you through the action we've got a new plate for the side so don't worry about that just waiting for that to come in at the galvers now i'll get uh, fitted just from the inside there with a special rivet which fits blindly but don't worry i've got a plan how we do that okay so we're gonna go for it put that back together we're all done our um our heater distribution box back together any second now we'll give it a final buff up so it's nice rivets in let's go our rivet set here we'll just like <laughs> in we go our first our first one few more rounds much the same as that looking nice and shiny there so we'll get all those in
one more there. Little one for that. Shorter one there. So we've got to keep that flush with the gasket. So we want to go in for the top. Let's make sure we've got enough coverage on that rivet. Maybe a little bit longer on that one. It's got to get through quite a bit of plastic at the top here. Hoping you're still on shot. I'm just guessing that you're in shot. <coughs> And the last one going in, just up here. It should be built there. That sounds good. Listen to that action. Hmm. Nice action. I could be rude and say nice action on your flaps. There we have it. Okay, we've got that up. We've got some nice new gaskets for here, but we fit them to the bulkhead of the car as opposed to fitting them to this. They always seem to be attached to the car themselves and that would sit, well actually no, one and on about it's on the inside. This goes up inside the car. So we're going to need, I think we're going to put the the seal on this one for this one because it goes up inside so we need the, uh, the nice seal for that I'm hoping that we've got one we're going to go and have a look now I have a feeling that I haven't got that seal I think I've got the bulkhead the bulkhead seals but I don't think I've got the uh, this one I don't think I've ever actually seen one we want a nice airtight finish so we've got to have to have a rubber uh, a foam seal on there we could easily make one Let's go and see what's out there. Um, I have got some good foam stuff which we could use, so we could always make that. I don't think I've ever ordered one of them off eBay, although I seem to re recall them being on there. I'm going to have a little scout around. Leave that with me for two secs. Okay, well, I didn't have... Well, I did have in stock the, uh, the foam seal for the bulkhead. This goes inside the engine bay, and when you sit your heater box on it, it sits nicely on there. It comes with some... 3M double sided tape and that was off eBay but I've used it as a template for the inside of the heater box because I, I didn't think I've got one so I've just cut out a template with this super duper foam this is a different foam than the uh, the soundproofing stuff that I just used for the heaters I'm not quite sure the difference it looks just a bit thicker so that'll go nicely as a gasket on our face of our divert flap which goes inside by your feet in the car, just around on our diagram. Well, that's where the, uh, the heater box is there. It's around this area where that fits. So I'm gonna stick that on. This stuff's uh, self-adhesive. We got that onto there. And we got ourselves a nice use. We have here a lovely finished heater box. First flap is, funnily enough, is your cold air vent flap when you turn off uh, the fan that's the electrical fan switch on your on your dial not the heat control the um, the speed control for the fan is actually also linked to this flap so when I shut off the fan it completely closes that flap which stops any air at all coming to the face or your feet so turning off your fan on the symbol down to zero closes this flap completely which makes all the air go to the air vents so no air can get down that way so the full pressure of air is coming up to the fresh air vents and when you pull on the fan lever towards you it then puts the fan motor on full speed leaving this shut leaving all the force of the fan to force it out the air vents so you can see that not only does that detent lever on your dash this so imagine my hand now I'm on the fan speed control off speed one full speed all the way across like that closes this because it wants it's you're telling it to turn the heating system off so nothing's coming to your feet nothing's going to the vents and if your vent fresh air, uh, nothing's going to your feet and nothing's going to your windshield windscreen the demist completely blocked the other flap is the feet and uh, windscreen diverter so all the way to your feet or the other way all the way out of here to the windscreen so that's that's that one 
that just simply toggles it between the two. But this one, I wouldn't think it, but this one is just connected on the lever to the speed control of the fan, so all the way to the right, closes this off, no air can get into this system that way, so it can only now go to the fresh air vents, if indeed you've got your fresh air vent open. If you have, you've got full power available, if you pull the detent lever towards you, it puts full 12 volts to the fan, and that way you're getting fresh air, full fresh air, and nothing else going to your feet or the windscreen. And that's how it works, it effectively gives you a boost of air which is the closest you get to aircon and it's full fresh air that's, that's how it does it by closing that lid down so nothing can get there that's what it's for so the lid nothing to do with the heating it's simply for full fresh air to your face shuts that effectively shuts this box completely off isolates this box out of the air, um, air distribution so that's what that lever does so I think if with that and the heater rebuild video you should be able to understand exactly how your heater works when I assemble the dash We'll go through connecting the cables up and getting them just to the right point so your levers work in just the right places for these because you can set it with little grub screw here. That's the heater thing done. We'll now take this up to stores and box it. We're going to the loft now and box this up. And I'll show you the other parts uh, that are finished in the loft. We'll go through those again. Then we close the video and we thank you again for all your comments. Please try and comment, log on and get yourself a YouTube account if you've not got one. If you're just watching and clicking through, it's nice for me to know who's out there and what you're thinking so that I can help improve the videos. It's good to get people commenting among themselves, I find it's quite good. Have a chat amongst yourselves on the comments. Obviously, they come through me first for approval, but I do try and check them every day, so it won't be a delay, too much of a delay response. But have a chat amongst yourselves as well. And um, we appreciate all the constructive uh, criticism as well. That's always well received. I'll always take your advice. I'll always look into what you tell me. I'd never ignore anybody. I'm watching everybody's uh, comments. I'm taking the time as well to reply. I'm taking the time to make the films. Also to go to work to pay for this escapade, as it ain't cheap. And um, doing everything I can for you at Cortina City. I hope you like the video of the uh, Woody, the abandoned GXL in the forest. Um, and we hope that in the next part we'll be taking you into the body shop. So that'll be body shop based. You've seen a little clip of me doing the, the mouldings. So we just finished off. We're going to go through everything now before we close. Let's go through a summary of what we've, we've been up to. And let's get it on. Oh. Now then, before I go, I forgot what I got forgot. I'm just carrying on putting stuff into stock, so that it's just an assembly job. That includes the Sundin glass collection, which we're, we're building up. This is a rear window. It's not the original window from the car. This is a piece of Sundin tinted glass, which we're, we're going to fit. I'll show you what I mean by Sundin. This is probably the wrong way around on the writing, but just here, you're going to notice that it says the word Sundin backwards. That's backwards. I'm coming in from the back there. The original Ford Sundin glass. It's a tinted glass which they have on two litre E's and it always looks nice and uh, it does help keep the car cool. So we're cleaning the inside face of that and we're checking the electrical resistance on the heated demister. I'm going to just apply 12 volts to it and then just get a kettle and get some steam and just try and mist, uh, mist the screen up a bit. We're also going to apply a dealer decal just to see what it looks like. I've had some Ford dealer stickers made and I've got five made and so I'm down to four now because I sent one off to uh, Jim. So we're going to place the dealer sticker in so it's done and out of the way. After we've already cleaned the glass, glass cleaner on it there. I'm just also going to check the electrical connections. It's initially looking okay on the meter reading. It's shown me a resistance across there so at least some of those tracks will be alright. But we're going to check them all anyway with continuity. Uh, we can easily do that with a meter either side of the, the pin. We're going to put a dealer sticker in anyway and see what it looks like. And um, hopefully it can just stay in there. So doing that as well as uh, beginning to take you through all our subcomponents that we've done. I know you keep seeing this axle on the front all the time. And that you've seen that heater box there today. But we'll, we'll summarise and finish off the filming by just letting you know where I am with assembled components. Let's put a dealer sticker in here and have a look. Okay, our Ford dealer sticker there, which I've made this one up on Photoshop and got a, a label printing company to run those off. And uh, we've got that done now. 
the only thing is I don't want it too low down I don't want it too high up whereabouts that I want uh, the location I wanted it hits the triplex Sundim logo and it slightly goes over the, the label but otherwise you're not going to be in the bottom and in the center I think I'd be too high up if I went anywhere else so just gonna have to be the way I mean that's how the dealer would have done it he would have just reached into the back there and stuck that in so there's no need to go crazy about it but I think that worked quite well I based it on an old design that I saw and then just put in my dealer on and uh, that's it the uh, the uh, the story behind the dealer stickers uh, ask me at a show about that one but it's just a, it's a long story but done on the format of a an original Ford dealer sticker but um, with probably a non-original dealer location it's just uh, a little in joke the um, the name of the dealer but uh, yeah it's made up and there it is okay so dealer sticker in I've just about to put it behind the Sundim logo otherwise it'll be either too high up or too low down I like, I like that Ford dealer sticker it's done on the old design because don't forget in the uh, lend of the 70s they changed that to a darker blue and changed the way the, the dealer stickers were done I mean obviously uh, you'll know a lot of dealers had their own stickers made up but uh, there was a standard format this is the very earlier format before the 80s looking dealer stickers that uh, blue there slightly um, more cyan and then the supplied by is on the left hand side there slightly different design to the 80s ones that you see the 80s ones are good but they suit uh, this one will suit this earlier earlier 70s label so clean the inside of the screen electrical test for the uh, demist and now bubble wrap there's our bubble wrap we bubble wrap up our screen done and into the stores it goes let's look at the rest of the kit now I was very pleased with the air filter results I think you'll agree it looks new old stock we nicely repaired that cone there um, we did a little few little repairs on the cone to bring it in and make it look nice that's high temp paint on there and then our lovely specially mixed paint for that which we talked about really tough finish great stuff and that matches nicely our rocker cover which is just over here so you can see we've got a nice uh, color match and our starting to build our clips up on the side of the rocker cover and needs its oil filler cap we've got one of them so those items done the heater box just hiding under there you saw that on earlier videos steering wheel you saw on earlier films looking very nice so we build up these parts so it just becomes a kit form so that's how we're, that's what we've been getting on with in part 31 let's go down and see some more stuff dashboard we know about we've already covered the dash in the earlier films still holding out and still working I've had it powered up still works beautifully that's always looking nice the dashboard let's just boot it up for you ignition mobilizer and then off we go with our dash lights so we know we're doing good with the, with the dash there's not really much to do it's ready for us to install a few little bits of wiring to tidy up on that but I'll do that as I get closer to the time so dash okay fuel light flashing on the dash and we've got it hot wired nice uh, not too um, in your face fuel light that auto dims as well I think I told you about that flash again any second there you go okay let's go and look at the rest of the bit various uh, various bits of trim here you saw that steering wheel I just want to bubble wrap in actually that's held out nicely real nice piece centre console so look loads of bits door cards on top of there just um, in the upstairs in the loft we've got the a sort of assembly of bits all sorts of odd stuff uh, door card pads and then some some of the spares which are starting to get ready together going through spares just to see building up ignition leads and bonnet light they're starting to build up kits to build up the engine bay some of the galvanized stuff stored up here as well so we'll, we'll see you soon we thank you very much for sorry guys i just cut off there halfway through that clip i ran out of battery just give it a quick charge to finish off thanks for all the comments the workshop we're going to leave you from the workshop now I'm going to take you on to part 32, I hope it is part 32. So I apologise if I get the part bits wrong, I'm always doing it. Alright, so we leave you and we say, oh yes, thanks and bye.
From me here, Culty the City, thanks for all the comments and the support on YouTube. I hope there's some interesting bits in this film. Uh, just to anyone help uh, helping uh, out there, anyone that can help out there, sorry, uh, assembling their axle or brakes. We're hoping you found some interesting little bits in this month's instalment. So we're going to get it uploaded for you and um, we'll see you in the end of April for a special film on the uh, the woody car in the, in the woods there. And we'll be starting to film straight away with filming part 32, which should include the priming of the car, if not the painting of the car. Because I'm going to run out of stuff in stock to do, I can tell you that much. Once I've done the front headlight conversion, uh, the halogen glass lenses, I'm going to be running out of stuff. I'm going to be sat in that workshop, ready for that car to come back to me. Well, actually, no. <laughs> I'll be doing the engine. We'll be filled. We're going to be on the engine. What am I talking about? We're going to be on the engine. We've got the engine and boxer sorted out. That's going to be our final job. Engine and box. We're going to have that axle oil all done, all over there done. We're going to have that clip all over, completely finished, power steering tested. Then we do the engine. At the same time as the engine, I'm going to guess that the shell comes back. Okay, so that's the rough plan. Over and out for this part of the film. We'll see you soon for more uploads. And again, log on or get on Twitter or give us a blast and try and promote the channel. People just don't know it's there. The amount of people at the car show I met, oh, I didn't know about the channel. And then they got on, they wish they'd have seen it a long time ago. Please, can you help me? Just plug the hell out of this channel on anywhere you can. And uh, let's keep it building because it helps me out when I'm getting that traffic in and I know that people are watching it. I've got a good audience base already and we appreciate you for that. And um, we really do. I'll try and comment to each and every one of you, alright? But if you can help me and get it promoted somehow. Think of any, even car mags right off to the car mags i've tried i've tried all sorts and with it whether because it's coming from me or not i don't know but if enough people hassle them they're going to give us a big feature out there all right let's go for gold over and out thanks a lot let's go see ya good night Roof, Bramble, video starts soon. Roof, Bramble, we've not forgotten. See ya. By the way, Good Friday, wash out. Am I in? Yeah. Okay, Rick, risk it. <laughs> this is the bit at the end of the film. Ah, <laughs> shit! <laughs> oh, no! Get it over with, Rick. I don't want to look. Right. We've got to do the beginning of the film, Al. Do you want to be in it? <laughs> right. We've rolled in, didn't it? <laughs> Good armchair, this, isn't it? Welcome to part 31. Alan's over there and he's going to be in the film. Yeah. What? Again, Rick? No, I'm alright, Rick. Can I store this over there for a bit? Can I store it over with the other bits, this? I've got to store it here for a few weeks before I cut it up. Pay you extra money, Al. It's quite. Some lounge are quite nice up here.